So enjoy the talk. Badass in computer science, please welcome from the Department of Informatics, Nana. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. I hope the stream hears me as well. And uh, thank you for coming. First of all, to be honest, I'm a little bit curious, so I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And I would like to know, um, who knows who this is? Who has any idea? I'm not going to ask you to tell a biography or anything, just to get an impression. Who knows who this is? Okay, two people, more than nothing. Who knows who this is? Okay, I see one hand, maybe two. Who knows who this is? That's more. I expected that. Who knows who this is? Yeah, getting more. But who knows who this is? No one. Who knows who this is? I expected nothing less at this point. Who knows who this is? And lastly, these two lovely women? Nobody. Okay. In order of appearance, this is Dorothy Rowan. This is Hedy Lamar. Grace Hopper. Ada Lovelace. Audrey Tang. Patricia Ordonez. Clem Breslin. And these are two of the six initial programmers of the ENIAC. I hope that at the end of this talk, you will all have at least a faint idea who these people are, because I will be talking about them. So uh, let's get started. Badasses in computer science and why we need to talk about them. So that there are no, or at least not so many, misconceptions or misunderstandings, I would like to give you a few pointers before I actually start. There is a quote being attributed to Winston Churchill that goes, the only statistics you can trust are those you falsified yourselves. I trust some of you will have heard this before. This is something that I cannot stress enough. Numbers sometimes appear to be objective, to be uninfluenced by the people who present them to you, but that's not the case. Statistics are always subjective, sometimes consciously falsified or consciously misattributed. So please always critically reflect when you see any kind of diagrams, numbers, anything. And I might just have made mistakes. People do that, or the people who I copied uh, the pictures from. With history comes controversy. This is often true when we talk about things that are not well or not at all documented, things that have happened a long time ago. And I try to refer to what historians commonly agreed upon, but sometimes there is controversy and sometimes I might have missed something that appeared to me to be agreed upon and that is not, or people might change their minds. So as with every historic topic, things can still change or things might not be complete as I present, present them. So this is kind of related to what I'm going to say next. This does not claim to be a complete or comprehensive list. There are many more people, there are many more impressions and things important about computer science, and I cannot talk about them all, but I selected some that I felt were interesting. Also, there is a certain focus on women in this talk. Now, why is that? That is because women in computer science is a topic that sometimes people say has been talked about enough. That's not current anymore and it's just not necessary to discuss it again. And I disagree. I think it's still a big topic, but this talk is not only about women. It's also about those not on the binary spectrum, about those being discriminated against because of race or because of traditions or anything else. So there's people in here that are not strictly speaking women and there are people in here that are women and also belong to another minority and that's important. But I put a certain focus on this because I think the topic of women in computer science has not been fully elaborated on and still needs attention. But now we get to the actual content of the talk. I want to motivate to you why I created this talk in the first place, because many of you will not know me. I have never given a talk like this in front of any significant number of people, be it scientific or cultural or anything else before. So a fair question is, why am I starting now? And what made me pick this? I'm not an expert in these areas. I do not have any higher education in history, social studies, gender studies, or anything else. I just got interested in it and read up upon it and had the feeling I needed to tell people about it. 
The three main reasons why I picked the topic and started doing the research are as follows. There was a talk I listened to at an event, a small event, significantly smaller than the one we're currently at, um, that was basically advertised as being a review of the historic women, transgender and genderqueer people in computer science and other technology-related fields. And I was looking forward to that talk, but in the end I was a little bit disappointed. I was not disappointed because it was in any way unconstructive or the discussion wasn't nice, it was. And there were very interesting sub, uh, aspects, but there were only two names of women actually in computer science, two people that we talked about, and that's not a lot, even if we are a new discipline. So I had the feeling there need to be more people, there need to be more names that could have been talked about here and that should be talked about at all. So I went looking for them. Another factor in my interest was a study that was commissioned by Microsoft and that they published first the conclusion out of and then the full study uh, last year, several months ago by now, and they tried to explain why European girls don't have a greater interest in STEM, in computer science, in mathematics, in engineering fields and technological fields. And they also tried to find out um, when people lose interest because what they found, which is not at all surprising, we have other studies to show this, is that younger girls and younger children in general have a greater interest in computer science, in tech and everything else than as when they get older. And they found a significant break around puberty in middle school. And what they identified as one of the main factors in this break was simply a lack of role models, a lack of people these girls could look up to who would show them that this is a field worth getting into and that they are not alone in their interest. And I think that's not to be neglected. So we need these role models and they are there, but they're not being talked about enough. So that's why we're here. The last reason are several single experiences I had at more than one university and more than one lecture. Slides that I saw and that I felt some discomfort with. Like I was looking at them, I was like, something's wrong, something doesn't feel right until some point where I realized what felt wrong, and I'm going to show you and I'm going to tell you about that in just a minute. So enough motivation. I told you why I started this talk. Let's talk about what it is about. To do that, I would like to take apart t the title I gave it, Badasses in Computer Science and why we need to talk about them. There are several words in there that I you know, could have picked differently, but I didn't. And here's why. We're starting with the badasses. One thing up, up front, this is a term used purely in its positive connotation in this talk. I do not mean any negative or uh, insulting meaning that might have been attributed to it over the time, but I mean it positively. And why do I call them badass? Some of them were pioneers in the sense that they radically broke with established cultural standards, with standards that we now consider to be outdated, to be wrong, but that were at the time everywhere. They broke with this, and that's not an either easy thing to do. At times when women were not allowed to receive higher education or black people were never given positions where they had white people under them, they set their minds to it, they persevered and they did it. They got there and they broke these cultural stereotypes. Some of them did not receive any recognition for what they did and they deserved it. They would have deserved the recognition, they simply did not get it, and they, I think they should get it now. And some, simply put, contributed something so broad and so important to the field that we still use it today and that it's still significant today and that, in a sense, makes them badass, at least in my opinion. You can judge for yourselves. Next part, badasses in computer science. What exactly do I mean when I talk about computer science in a talk that's somewhat about histor historic times and historic subjects? The term is not exactly well defined. In the past, people called fields differently than we would now, or there were fields that were not separated yet, or were still separated even though now they're considered to be related. This is not an easy word. So I include, amongst others, the area of, well, computing, and I mean from the time when computing was still done by people, by people called computers, whose job it literally was to compute things, a job that was often done by women, which not many people know. 
I also include the area of computer engineering, the area of informatics or computer science, as we often call it now, and sometimes also areas somewhere between computer science and other STEM subjects. So STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and they kind of overlap, especially in the past. So they will all be mixed in somewhat. I don't take a very strict definition here. So let's go on to the subtitle. Why is it we, the people here right now, need to talk about this? First of all, we need to because others don't, or they don't do it enough. So someone has to, and I'm glad that some people are willing to, and you're here because you're willing to do this. And previously I mentioned some lecture slides that I stumbled across uh, in my master studies of computer science, and I don't feel comfortable showing these slides as they are here because they're not public, and I did not have the chance to ask anyone permission, so I kind of built some mock-ups that give you a very good idea of what these slides looked like, and I want to show them to you. There's two of them. One is this one. It was titled something like Innovation and Progress and How It is Driven by People, and it was a slide just with pictures. Anyone familiar with the names that I put on the slide will realize that you can actually sum this slide up pretty easily in two words. Does anyone want to guess? Yeah, white males, or white men, exactly. <laughs> and that doesn't really feel right, does it? Well, it doesn't to me. There's often an argument being made about how statistically white men were the dominant force in computer science, apart from the fact that at some points this wasn't actually true. I still think that there are enough people that show diversity in tech and in computer science that deserve a place on these slides. And with just a tiny bit of effort and a tiny bit of thinking about what you're doing, you could have included them at this point without it feeling out of place or constructed or anything. And now I have a second slide about frequency hopping. I trust that at least some people about you know what frequency hopping is. It's not technically extremely important here, but it's important in our lives, like we use it in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, etc. And the important line is put in bold. It was not in bold on the original slide. And uh, I can see at the grins on some faces that you might have already spotted the problem. Frequency hopping was invented by two people, one actress and one pianist. We have here George Antiel, who is the pianist, but no further mentioning of any woman, actress, other person. And that's just not true. Well, the other reason why I think that we, particularly at this event, the people here should talk about the subject, is that Germany, the country we are currently in, is not exactly a role model when it comes to these things. Like, even in Europe, there are several countries with a considerably higher percentage of non-male computer scientists with university degrees. These numbers are just about university degrees, not someone who has gotten into tech or computer science any other way, but it's kind of representative. And, for example, in Bulgaria in the year 2012, there was almost a number twice as high as in Germany of computer scientists with university degrees. So it's not exactly like we're leading edge or cutting edge in any way in this subject. And outside of Europe, the pictures actually different as well. I recently met two people from Tunisia, two computer scientists, and when they came to Germany, they were like, why is it, why is it so weird? Why are there so few women? Like, we're not considered a minority there. Compu women in, in computing subjects are simply considered normal. And for example, in India, 44% uh, of all degrees in the general areas of IT and computing in the year 2015 were given to women or to people who identify female, at least according to a report by the government, but I don't think they actively changed any numbers significantly there. So there is a significant number of women in computing in these countries. Why not here? Honestly, I don't know, but it, I think it has a lot to do with culture and with stereotypes and our structures. So why is it that we actually need to talk about this? I think I'm motivated why it's purposeful and why it might make sense and why it's nice, but not why it's actually necessary. 
aside from the fact that diversity in these areas would be both fair as well as smart, because you're kind of wasting potential if you don't give a lot of people the opportunity to go into computer science or tech, it's just influencing everyone involved, not just the women, not just the non-binaries, but also the males. That's actually an interesting point. You're missing opportunities here. And the second part is that it won't change on its own. History has shown us that this is a problem that does not fix itself, that we can't just sit out and wait for it to be over. That's not how it works, so we need to actively do something about it. There is an implicit rule according to which people tend to act, especially when they're in larger groups. They tend to look for people similar to themselves. If a group is fairly homogenous in certain aspects, and that aspect can be area of expertise, gender, race, anything really, introvert behavior, whatever, they tend to pick people to join them that are similar, similar in that aspect. In German, there's a word for that, which is homosoziale kooptation. And that's you know, not a very common word, and I totally get why. But the effect is significant. For example, in everyday lives, when you try to get a job, and there is nine people that are all the same gender, the same race, the same kind of person, and you want to bring some diversity in that, they will go, hmm, I don't know if you fit in here. I'm not sure this will work. But if someone who's very similar to them will apply, they will have a lot less you know, doubts about this. And that's a fact that psychologists have been monitoring for a while, and that definitely is there, and that's a problem. That's a problem that means if we have diversity, it might maintain itself because it has positive aspects, because it's a good thing. But if it's not there, it might keep itself from happening. So we actively need to get to a point where we can rely on stability to take effect. And then there is a multiplying effect. Every one of us can be the person to multiply these stories and to talk about the subject, to act differently than all the people out there who are apparently not doing what I think they should be doing. And we should never underestimate how much we can influence other people, how much everyday conversations, how much books and slides and presentations can change the lives around us. In this context, I can recommend the Notable Technical Women, uh, which is an organization who provide downloads, for example, of card decks, of posters and stuff, with women and non-binaries that were important in the field of tech and in the field of computer science. And they actually show you like pictures and short biography information and stuff. And it's actually a nice way to see how many people there are out there. Walter Isaacson, who knows that name? Who's ever heard that before? Okay, he wrote a book that is called The Innovators, how a group of hackers, geniuses, and geeks created the digital revolution. And he talks about the gender gap as well. He does an interviews in the book and in everyday life. And he shared a quote about his daughter. And this goes, when women have been written out of the history, girls don't have great role models. But when you learn about the women who programmed ENIAC or Grace Hopper or Ada Lovelace, it happened to my daughter. She read about all these people when she was in high school. And she became a math and computer science geek. What he means to tell us is that role model effect again. If you keep minorities out of the story, you will not encourage other people to follow in their footsteps and to, you know, move from being a minority to being normal, to being present in the field. So we finally get to, why is it that we talk? Isn't there any other medium I could have used? Probably there is. But talking leads to other things. And because we can influence it so easily, it often changes what happens afterwards. In the past, there was not enough writing, reading, researching, talking about these people, but we can change that. For a short statistical impression, I picked 12 personalities that were chosen by the GE, Gesellschaft für Informatik in Germany, to be, to be represented in their personalities in computer science poster series. These are 12 individuals, three of them are women. And I selected this group because I did not want, not want to select the important people that I would present myself. I felt I would introduce a more prominent bias, so I let someone else do the choosing of the 12 personalities to be represented here. And there's a nice little tool that Google offers where you can search 
their huge digital book collection for recurring engrams, so expressions of one or more words. So what I simply did is I searched for these 12 names, and I hope you can somewhat see the idea of what is meant to be represented there. You can see how over the years these names occurred in texts and books and whatever. And as I said, we have three women in here, which are all represented in this little area of, of lines down here. So we have Sophie Wilson, Grace Hopper, Ada Lovelace. Sophie Wilson is the little green line that you can hardly see at the very bottom. Grace Hopper and Ada Lovelace, as we could see with more people knowing than at the beginning of this talk, are a little higher up, but nowhere near even, even the mid-level of the graph. This is, of course, just one statistical impression. Like, there could have been a lot more research. It's just an impression of why I feel that there is not enough talk about these people. Interestingly, but not entirely surprisingly, you get a very similar graph if you do this with Google Trends, so with, with most searched keywords over the last years. There, the, there is another quick graph, and I'm afraid the colors are not very well picked with the same people about uh, the amount of times people clicked on their Wikipedia page. So this is the page hit count. And once again, we can see all three of them down here. Like we have Sophie Wilson, Ada Lovelace, Grace Hopper. Not exactly a revelation, but a statistical reasoning for why I think this talking is necessary. There is one more slide with a picture that I want to mention about talking. And this, this is an excerpt of a presentation the GE did for their 40th anniversary. And in this presentation, they first presented the history of computer science and then the history of their organization. And in the part about computer science, there were a few, few slides about important personalities, as many people do when they talk about the history of a field. Actually, there were three personalities. Gottfried Leibniz, Alan Turing, and Konrad Zuse. And personally, I think they might have picked someone else, considering they actually have a big program about how women should be represented in computer science. So that could have been handled more optimal. This is just an example, of course. Now, why do we need to talk about them? That's an easy one. Can't very well talk with someone who's not around anymore. Usually can't easily talk with someone who's famous and living on the other side of the world. So we'll talk about them. But why is it we need to talk about them, about these people that I picked? That's a very subjective question. Like, I could have picked totally different people. Possibly if I read up on them first, if I had a different background, whatever. This is a list of the names that I researched for, uh, researched about for this talk. So there was a lot longer list of people I initially read up upon than the list that I'm actually presenting today. And I'm sure that every one of them has a story worth telling and that I missed several more that would have been just as deserving. But I picked some that I think we can learn a few lessons from and that would be a good start. Um, I, can, I just quickly want to recommend a project that is called The Untold History of Women in Science and Technology, which was published by the White House actually when President Obama was still in office. And they have nice like, pictures and audio reports by women about women um, in the field. And they have several computer scientists with really interesting stories. So if you're interested in that, just follow the link. The links at the bottom of the slides are usually either references or further reading material. Well, let's get started with those stories, right? We have separated the title. We've talked about why we're here. So let's start with the actual stories. Who is Ella Lovelace? And this is the name where the most hands went up at the beginning of the presentation, and I actually did expect that. This is maybe the name that has made it into the most computer science books, classrooms, whatever, of all the people in this talk. She's a very, uh, a fairly well-known name, but being both an important figure in early computer science and also a name in many initiatives to introduce girls to computing, like the Ada project, for example. Um, and sometimes of projects thankfully, of introducing non-male people into computer science, so not only women. To many, she is known as the first computer programmer, despite not actually having a computer, let alone a digital one. There is some controversy today whether she should have that title or not, but one way or another, 
She was called by a dear friend of hers, Charles Babbage, that many people here probably have heard of, the Enchantress of Numbers, and it's undeniable that her understanding of math and of the whole concept that she worked with is extraordinary. To sum up this particular part of her life that I referenced just now, she became friends with Charles Babbage very early in her life when she was about seven, and she kept that acquaintance until she died with about 36 years old. He was the one who described the analytical engine, which is uh, more or less the first design for a general purpose computer ever brought down to paper or ever kept historically. As many will have heard, it never finished construction while he or she were alive. But years after, he was proven correct and that his concept would have worked. Um, Ada was the one asked by Babbage to translate his notes, to translate his publication from the original French to English, and was thus the person to, made it, to make it widely heard and widely read. But she did not just translate, she also annotated. She annotated a lot, actually. Like, she for, produced four times the material that he originally gave her. And that's the interesting part. She added certain uh, vocabulary that we still use today, that is still used in today's lectures for computer science, that she coined with her translation. She added explanations, she added graphs and everything, and she added this picture. Does anyone have an impression of what this picture represents? This is, um, so to say, the first known computer program, an algorithm to compute Bernoulli numbers. And she added that to her translation. And this is the reason why many people call her the very first programmer, because this is considered a computer program written for a computer that had not been built at this point. And she was later proven to have been correct in assuming that this would work. Now, as I mentioned before, there is some controversy about how much of this originated with her or not, how much she just cleaned up things that others told her. But she obviously understood the concept very well and worked with it very well. And that's not something that many people at the time were able to do. And this is, in a way, due to her mother, which brings me to the part, what can we learn from her? What can we learn from her story? And her story starts with her parents uh, divorcing when she was very little. Her father, a poet, was not exactly held in high regards by her mother. We know that she talked about him pretty nastily throughout her life. and. Um, she kind of blamed her husband's loss of, well, sanity in her personal opinion due to him being a poet. So she kind of encouraged Ada to pursue math and science and all those kind of logical things. And that is something that we can, can learn right here, that support is very important to young people in general and minorities in particular. Ada herself did not have such a low opinion of poetry or of arts as her mother, and she liked to call herself a poetic scientist. That's not a term that we hear a lot these days, but in her opinion, creativity and poetry were not necessarily opposed to technology and computer science or math. I, I think this belief is not as widespread today as it should be. I personally agree that poetry and creativity and arts can go along with computer science fine and can help each other out, but not pe many people think that, and she was one of the first people to demonstrate that it kind of does work. Now, having been sick most of her childhood and youth, Ada was always a girl to study a lot, to read a lot, but in her time, library access was restricted to males which is a problem if you're a young woman who wants to read. So what she did is she sent her husband to the library for her. He would take out a book, copy it down on paper, and bring it back to her so she could read it. Personally, I imagine he could have thought of some other time to spend, uh, some other things to spend his time with, but that's what he did, and that's a way how she learned a lot of things that were kept from her through structural restrictions in, in her culture, in her society. And I think we can learn from that, that your allies and the people who fight with you, even if you're fighting for women, for minorities, for non-binaries, uh, for other races, that is not the only area where, where you can get your allies from. They can come from anywhere. Even if you're fighting for non-binary and women rights, males can help you and can be your allies. And that's something that some movements should reflect upon, because sometimes it's always opposed 
that if the minority is fighting for something, the majority are the enemies, and that's just not the case necessarily. You can get your allies from everywhere. Lastly, and this is rather simple, you can be a great computer scientist without a computer. She proved that, some other people proved that. So just because someone doesn't enjoy spending their whole day in front of a computer, they can still get in this world and they can still contribute, and that's important. Now, before we get stuck with Ada Lovelace, I want to continue to the next people on my list. Uh, there are six of them, actually. Kathleen Antonelli, Jean Bartik, Betty Holberton, Marlene Meltzer, Frances Spence, and Ruth Teitelbaum. Actually, you might have heard about one of these women or more before under different names, because most of them have two first names and have married at some point and changed their last name. So there's many names they're known under. I tried to pick the ones that are most common today, but if you find another name, don't be too confused, please. They were the six initial programmers for the ENIAC. Who's heard of the ENIAC before? Okay, that's more. Good. Um, as many other women in World War II, they started out as computers. I mentioned this before, people whose job it is to compute things with a pen and paper and calculators, desk calculators, and many of them were women because in World War II, men, well, they usually were in soldier activities or in some other areas that um, needed phys physical strength or that were considered to be more difficult, like hardware. The army built at this time maybe the first programmable all-electric general-purpose computer, the ENIAC. Some say it's the first, some say it's the second. It's around that time. And these six women were recruited to compute it. Why were women recruited to compute this? Well, because males were busy, busy with developing hardware. That's basically what it is. You have like actually a letter from that time from the person at the army responsible who says precisely that, that he wanted six female computers because all his male um, participants were busy. And they had nothing but the blueprints and the actual machine to work from, but they did their work admirably. They had a great influence on modern programming, if you will, or the programming that we use today. Um, for example, the use of subroutines goes back to these six women. And if Ada Lovelace was the first programmer, maybe these can be considered as the first digital programmers, or modern programmers, or whatever you want to call it. Some of them remained in the area. Actually, many of the women that got into computing areas, into tech areas, because what happened after World War II, especially in America, is that people were given back to the men coming back from the front. Like, there were actual campaigns for women to leave their jobs, for the soldiers to take back over and to go back home. But these skills, these skills were developed during World War II, which meant that the people who left before didn't have those skills, which is why many of them got to keep their jobs and they excelled at it. And one of them, for example, invented one of the first, the first, according to who you believe, sorting algorithm, something that we still use today, even three years before bubble sort was invented. Another two invented the first well, commercialized computers, really, that followed the ENIAC and went on to work with them. Now, this slide has a name that says refrigerator ladies. Has anyone heard that before? It's a term used for when women are used in photographs to promote products, like refrigerators, like technical products they have no relation to, they're just there for modeling, basically. And that's what these six were called. Even 50 years after they accomplished what they did, there was a huge dinner inviting everyone that worked in the ENIAC, honoring their work, and they were not invited because they had never been documented, really. What we see here is a newspaper cutting from 1948, so right after the war was over, and what we see is a man operating the ENIAC. That was very unusual at the time. A vast majority of programmers at the ENIAC were female, but they were not shown in the newspaper. The reason is simply that the army wanted to be men to be the programmers in the future, not the women. So they were not showing what is, but what they wanted. And that's an important point. This kind of you know, narrative, this kind of actively changing the story to promote a certain goal is not exactly uncommon, and especially not in the history of male dominance in computing and tech. But I'm not telling you this to frustrate you or to tell you that these women never got their recognition because someone went out and actually found them and told their story and today we know how important they were. 
but because I think we can some take something positive from this point, from this narrative concept. Does anyone have any idea what that could be? Like this whole concept of changing the narrative, changing the past to, to certain, certain things happening in the future? I think we can take it back. Like we can change the narrative, we can change what's talked about today, we can represent the minorities as they existed and as they should exist. And if it worked so well in the past, why would it not work now? I think it's worth a try. Now, what other things can we learn from these six women, the original ENIAC programmers? Please, work together, even if you're very different. Actually, we have reports from Jean Bartik, who was the last of them to live, and the one who actually still lived to see the recognition they got. Okay, I'm way behind time, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and they worked together, even though they were very different. They had a lot of conflicts at the beginning. Never underestimate a job because it's new. I told you about how men were considered to work on the hard problems, the hardware, and women were supposed to do the easy, easy thing, the software. And later on, when they realized that software is very important, they tried to give it back to male dominance. And never underestimate a job just because it's new. It might be very important in the future. And keep learning. Their story would have looked very differently if they hadn't gone with the progress. Well, they did later on, even though they had accomplished a big goal already, they worked with Grace Hopper, who at the time was developing the first higher level programming language. So something that actually had words, English words, and that was human readable. That was new at the time. She also developed a controller for that, and she played a big part in the COBOL programming language, which is still used today and still important today. She was sometimes dubbed the queen of software, and she also kind of, in an interview, she said, well, it's, you know, basically what I am. So she was not too modest about that. But maybe that's what we need, women who are more standing up for themselves. Interesting fact, contrary to popular belief, she did not coin the, the term bug, even though, you know, probably all know the moth shown down there. Um, but actually, Thomas Edison used that way before her, and many other people did too. She was told computers don't understand English when she did the first initiative of um, creating a programming language that was human readable. And obviously she proved them wrong. So that's what all of us can do too. If someone tells you it's not possible, find a way to prove them wrong. Um, you're never too old to be in computer science. Grace Hopper was actually retired against her wish and then got back from retirement because no one else could do her job and no one else could develop these things that she had started. And she finished it until she was rather old. Um, the last point is about the fact that you can pick what aspects of a role model you look up to. This is something she said and something I personally don't agree with um, because it implies that women are naturals at you know, cooking and doing household chores. And she was also not exactly an activist for women's rights. So you can you know, decide that a certain person in some areas was very important and in some areas might not be the role model you want to talk about to others. That's okay. Now I have someone else here, Dorothy Rowan, and I saw some hands go up when I showed a picture. Seriously, if you hadn't, haven't seen or watched Hidden Figures, I seriously recommend you, that you do. She's one of the three protagonists. She worked for the predecessor of NASA, and she was the first African-American supervisor and one of the first three female supervisors there. And she got there by perseverance. She literally bugged them until they let her do the job because no one else could. Also, she promoted her team and she kept all of their jobs by teaching them Fortran and by teaching herself Fortran and how to use the new computer that Armin was introducing to kind of get rid of all the people doing the job slowly and get a machine to do it quickly. And they never would have gotten there if they hadn't learned something new and hadn't learned something that no one else could teach them, but only they could teach themselves. And they did that. And they did it very effectively by looking ahead, by seeing the change that was coming. She also showed us that you can get career and family together. She raised six children at the time, her husband being in, in, job, in a job as well. And she showed us that racism can be broken because she persevered and she got through those cultural stereotypes. Now I'm going really short on time and I'm very sorry. So I'm going to uh, shorten this up a bit. This is Hedy Lamarra and I saw a few hands go up because I mentioned her before. She was the one inventing frequency hopping and was not mentioned on the slide I showed you. She took a very long time to get any recognition at all, even, so, even though her work was patented and was used by the army later on. 
she was also kind of an autodidact because what she learned about innovation, about technology, she tortured herself in her free time because acting, although her job and although she did it nicely and successfully, just wasn't enough to fill her life. So what I think she can teach us is to think outside the box because frequency hopping has a lot of elements from piano playing, from electric pianos, from other areas of uh, art that they used to create this. And it shows us again that arts or other disciplines and tech don't have to be separate. They can be combined. She was an actress and a successful inventor, and that's important. But as a slight warning, success can come without recognition. That can happen, and it's not necessarily the person's fault, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you weren't successful, that you failed, but it just means that people weren't able to see what you got and you didn't get the recognition that you deserved. Now I think we're down to two people. This is one, Audrey Tang. Uh, she's currently minister without portfolio in the Taiwanese gover government. And she um, is also an activist who promotes free software, autodidactism and individualist anarchism. She started programming at 12, left school two years later because she just couldn't get into the system, in her own words, and then went on to be successful in tech firms and by the age of 19 had been a successful entrepreneur at Silicon Valley. So she started out young and is in politics now. And uh, what we can learn from her is the fact that politics and computer science can and should mix. This is not something to be completely separate from each other. And that can be a good thing. Also, it's never too early for computer science. Like we had before, you can never be too old for computer science. You can't, can't also be too young. Teach your children early. Show them early what possibilities there are. Um, Audrey Tang was originally known under a different name. She changed her name to reflect her gender identity and uh, by now has established that she's being called by female pronouns, that she's being called by a female name, and has her outward appearance like that. And I'm sure that was a hard trip for her to get there. Um, but she did it, and I'm glad that she did. Now, last on my list, no, second to last on my list, Patricia Ordonez. The interesting part about her is that she actually wanted to go into tech. She wanted to study computer science and electrical engineering because she was excellent at math in school. She was actually tutored specifically by her teachers because she was so good at it. But when she got to college, she realized that all of her male classmates had a significant advantage because at the time, uh, computers were marketed as boys' toys and they had programmed and learned with that for years and she had never laid hands on a computer before. What happened to her is that in a programming level entry, cl entry level class, uh, she asked a question, and what she says, her professor answered, is you should know that by now, and he was not willing to answer that question, because most people in the class did know, but she had no possibility to know that, never having had such experiences at home. She then dropped out of her studies, and she went into foreign languages, but ten years later, with the help of a mentor, she got back into tech, she got back into computer science, and she is now an assistant professor in computer science in Puerto Rico, and very proud of that. And in some cases, this shows that it might not be your fault. It might not be you, it might be the, simply the system. And that's not fair, that's not how it should be. It's never too late to learn. Even 10 years later, she managed to build a successful career, and I'm glad that she did. I would have preferred she did it 10 years earlier, because there wouldn't have been a system that kept her from it. But even as it is, she did it, and it's never too late to learn. And please, if you ever get into a situation like this, or if you see someone getting in a situation like this, encourage them to persevere, help each other out, because people don't deserve to be kept back by a system and by structures and by cultural standards. Now the last person is Clem Breslin. I saw no hands go up at the beginning of the talk with, with their picture, um, and I understand that. This story, and also the last two, is more of a personal story than of a big success story, because sometimes role models don't have to be historic, gigantic figures that influenced everything in the industry. Sometimes they can just have something to teach us. He did not study computer science, anything else. He did something completely different, then struggled to find a job, and um, finally got into tech, and they found themselves at Silicon Valley and said something I thought was very important. They said, it took me a year to come out to everyone as being genderqueer and asking everyone to call me by gender-neutral pronouns. That's been hard. There have been moments of friction and misunderstanding and just ignorance along the way. As a genderqueer person, 
it's not easy to be in a society where people think that's something weird or something not to be considered, because it is not weird and it is to be considered, and they should feel at home just as well as anyone else. And what we can take from that is very nicely captured another uh, quote of them, which is, you are disrupting things just by virtue of stepping out and bringing things to light that would have never surfaced before. Because anyone can do that. If you stand up for who you are, if you stand up for what you want to see in the world, you can change things. It's not just people in higher positions who have a lot of people under them that can change things, but everyone can. And another thing that is more about learning to help others is that you should never underestimate how much a small chance can encourage and motivate a single person. What they say is people start calling me they and they make me feel like they finally see me. That's a motivation. This rather simple thing of using a pronoun that the person wants to be used for them, that can actually mean a lot of difference. And Clam did not only experience these problems in tech with being genderqueer, but also in LGBTQIA organizations and cultures with being in tech, because that's not statistically the normal case there. And Clem says that he actually experienced some problems and discrimination there as well. So this goes both ways. So I did it at the time, but I'm finally in the end. Thank you for listening. Thank you for staying, even if I'm a bit late. Um, I brought two more pictures that I found interesting. The left one many of you will have seen is the drop of females in computer science in the 80s. The other one is a newspaper cutting from 1967 uh, um, from the Cosmopolitan, I think, which is titled The Computer Girls, and the article aimed to get girls into computing. Now, why did that change? When did that change? I don't know. I don't know why, but I would like to know. If there are any quick questions, I'm happy to take them. If you have any questions that I can't answer here, because I overestimated the time I had, uh, I will be happy to take them later, and thank you so much for listening. Yes. Um, yeah, I see that. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I tried to read up on that, but there's several split opinions on how that worked. But I think um, the most probable uh, explanation that I found is that the first one in the 80s was when computers were introduced at homes and they were marketed as boy toys. And 2003 was a time when uh, we got a lot more like small computing devices, ubiquitous computing and stuff, and that once again was targeted at boys. And some people say that this had influence, but that's not the only possible explanation. So as far as I know, there is not the one explanation that experts agree upon. Did I repeat the question? I think I didn't. The question was what happened in 2003 on that diagram. Any other quick questions? All right. I think there's none. So, so, so. thanks.